And so it's with great uh, excitement, because I've not heard this gentleman speak before, and I've so much been looking forward to today's presentation. I'd like to introduce to you Karta Perk Singh Khalsa. He is a yoga raj in Ayurvedic medicine with several certifications. He is one of the country's foremost natural healing experts. He has years of experience in, in alternative medicine. He is the president emeritus of the American Herbalists Association, and he's a current board member for the National Ayurvedic Medical Association. One of the things that makes him most interesting is that he incorporates a variety of different medical traditions to help people achieve optimal wellness. So he combines a thorough knowledge of Ayurveda, Western medicine, and traditional Chinese medicine. He has a school called the International Integrative Educational Institute, and he has been training professional Ayurvedic practitioners for over 30 years. Uh, KP is the only American to hold the title of Yoga Raj in Ayurveda and is the first person to be dual credentialed in both uh, herbalism as a registered herbalist and also in Ayurveda. And so I am proud to introduce to you KP Kalsa. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Well, we have a lot to cover today, so let's go ahead and get started, and we want to leave the time for questions. So this is going to be sort of Ayurveda 101 in a nutshell and then moving right on to autoimmune. Uh, issues. All right, so we see the slide here with the telephone number and the access code at the bottom. Just take note of that, again, if you have uh, issues today. Our discussion today is on uh, autoimmune disorders where the body attacks itself, and this idea is uh, gaining ground in medical circles uh, very substantially uh, in recent uh, times. There are 80 different disorders now that are thought to be autoimmune it seemed to be an underlying mechanism for many, many things that happen in the body, including uh, inflammatory aspects of cardiovascular disease, dementia, and numerous things like that. We'll touch on a few of these today, but I want to talk about the underlying mechanism for this, which is what Ayurveda really uh, specializes in. So it's an abnormal response from the immune system to a normal body part. Your body thinks that uh, your thyroid or your uh, connective tissue or some other organ is uh, the enemy and it attacks it in an inflammatory process. Some examples you might know, we see here psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, 80 of them all together, but these are some of the uh, big ones. Uh, this is very much the uh, sort of disease of the month now. You know, we've gone through many of these phases. I've been doing this for 47 years and I've seen these ideas come and go where, you know, everything was caused by candida or everything was caused by, you know, fill in the blank. Well, now it's kind of autoimmune there. So it's probably over-exaggerated, but very much an issue that deserves some attention. Uh, I have extensive handouts available for this class. There are about a dozen documents that will be available to you that go into much more detail describing the treatments we're talking about and such things. Here's the address for that. If you just go there and, uh, and click through there, you'll get access to those and you can uh, read them. It'll give you a lot of background that we can't cover in this short uh, webinar. Ayurveda, the word comes from uh, two Sanskrit words, ayus, which means life, and veda, which is science or knowledge. You've probably heard that word uh, before. Generally, people call it the, uh, the science of life, the medical side of these ideas. So yoga and um, Ayurveda, are inseparable. They're the same science, they come from the same root, the same philosophy, and very often yoga practitioners recommend and practice Ayurveda and likewise in the opposite direction, the exact same uh, science in uh, every way. Uh, yoga is the, uh, the word actually means divine union. It uh, comes from the same uh, word as the underlying root as the word yoke in English, and the idea is to yoke yourself or connect yourself to your a divine consciousness to uh, the divinity of the universe, connecting to be all you can be uh, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Whereas Ayurveda is generally considered to be the medical uh, system. So Ayurveda focuses more on keeping you healthy so you can do those things in terms of personal evolution. There's some argument about what the oldest uh, medical system really is, but it seems like from archeological digs that Ayurveda lays good claim to being the oldest continuously practiced indigenous medical system in the world. Therefore, many people call it the mother of all healing. We know that Ayurveda was already in its ascendancy and well-developed 5,000 years ago at least, uh, because people by that time were already literate, they were already writing things down, and they made detailed star maps of where the constellations were in the heavens. And as we know, they slowly move over the centuries. So if we computer star date 
those maps back to when the this heavens looked like that, it was 5,000 years ago. Now, we don't have any 5,000-year-old books. We have copies of copies of copies, but they were uh, writing those things down that far. Ayurveda appears to be the genesis of Western medicine, Greek and then Roman medicine, which became uh, modern medicine today, and also going eastward, Chinese medicine, East Asian uh, medicine. So the Ayurvedists uh, previously were interacting with people like Hippocrates that you've heard of, and then Chinese medicine is 90% uh, identical to Ayurveda. If you learn one, it's very easy to learn the other. Some differences in vocabulary and uh, some overlap of uh, medicines. So we're here to talk about Ayurveda today. It's a system that serves about 2 billion people in Central Asia uh, even today, and it's quite active, continuously practiced for these thousands of years. Ayurveda talks about three primal metabolic forces that regulate everything in your body. And to strip it to its essence, uh, these are those forces, vata, pitta, and kapha. Each of those is called a dosha. A dosha is a metabolic force that runs your body but has a tendency to go out of balance if you don't treat things properly. So we could call Ayurveda this tridosha system. The three metabolic forces create a beautiful balance that we would call homeostasis, where the body is self-regulating and it, it writes the ship, just like we see here, the ship with three masts. They're all beautiful, flexible, and responsive, and uh, you can uh, steer the boat perfectly. But if uh, one of the masts uh, develops extra stress and snaps, then you've got a chaotic mess. So we want to keep these things in balance. Vata is regulated, uh, regulates movement. So the movement of your joints, the movement of breath in and out of your lungs, it's the nervous system, essentially. It's the master commander, the master computer system that runs everything else. Pitta is about heat and metabolism, endocrine function, digestive juices. It's the only source of body heat in the body. And that's the main one we're going to concentrate on today because it's uh, also responsible for uncontrolled or inappropriate inflammation when it uh, goes out of uh, whack, when it goes in excess. A cuppa is responsible for building and repairing your tissues, so uh, solidity, structure, and uh, lubrication. These doshas each have a home, a place where they like to accumulate and where they do their job. Kappa lubricates the upper torso, the lungs and stomach with uh, lubricating fluids like mucus. A pitta concentrates in the small intestine, the most metabolically active area of your body, the hottest area where all those hot juices are flowing in from all those digestive organs stomach, pancreas, uh, bile from the liver, all mixes together and shreds your food into its molecules that go out into your tissues. Vata concentrates in the large intestine and uh, does its job of drying out the food and uh, preparing it to be eliminated. So as those uh, metabolic forces go out into your body and regulate the whole process, uh, they, they uh, are supposed to do a great job in staying balanced and do their job. But if they get uh, out of balance, they cause uh, problems. We mainly look at three categories of what we call energetics, things in your body that you can measure based on your own personal experience just with your human body, temperature, weight, moisture, and weight. These three characteristics we could apply to any medicine, any person, any disease. And again, we want them to stay in that very narrow uh, middle range that's uh, appropriate for maintaining the health. Weight we might better call tissue density. It does include what the scale says, but it goes beyond that. Do you have the proper amount of flesh on your body to be able to run your body properly and to have all the metabolism do what it's supposed to do? So we'd like it to be right in the middle, not too heavy, not too light. And that would apply to something like food. Uh, you know, a, a Big Mac, a milkshake and fries would be a heavy meal, and a you know, lettuce salad would be a light meal. Um, obesity, of course, would be a... a a heavy condition, but so would soggy uh, edema in the tissues. Temperature also includes the actual body temperature, but probably a better way to describe that would be metabolic rate, or how fast your body is burning calories to run all your metabolic uh, needs. You may not feel hot, and yet Ayurveda would say you have a hot metabolism, or you're burning calories faster than you need to and wasting energy and causing uh, extra metabolic inflammation, and that's our topic for today. So we want things to be right in that little uh, area in the middle where you have a little bit of wiggle room, but it's the, uh, the zone of what we call dynamic balance, where it can change minute by minute, day by day, but it has a very narrow range. You get too hot, and uh, you end up with inflammatory uh, processes. 
Uh, these go beyond sort of the conventional English understanding of these words. Moisture doesn't mean water. It really slime would be a better way to describe it. That beautiful slimy in a good way, lubricating tissue that uh, smooths the way for everything in your body. So the synovial fluid in your joints, the oil in your skin, your cerebral final fluid, that's all biological moisture. And we'd like everything to be just wet enough. Too wet, things get soggy, chemicals get diluted in your body. Too dry, things get unlubricated and crunchy. So maybe a better way to describe this would be tissue juiciness. We want your tissue to be just exactly the right amount of juicy so that everything runs properly, everything flows, everything's lubricated. When those three things are all working properly and they're all in that middle range, you have beautiful homeostasis or balance. So we look at these three doshas and we're looking at the one that's become excess uh, due to various factors in your life, various choices, diet, lifestyle. Uh, you can live a life that will cause one of these to slowly begin to dominate and then it starts to cause the pathologies that are characteristic of this uh, of this dosha. So vata is dry, cold, and light, and it's the main dosha that brings dryness to the body. Uh, pitta, digestion, body heat secretions, it's wet, hot, and light, but mainly it brings heat. So inflammation, hot and wet, that's what we're talking about today. Kappa is about lubricating and building tissue. It brings wetness, coldness, and heaviness. So each of these has a characteristic uh, that dominates that we want to look at, and today we're concentrating on heat because of these autoimmune disorders. Bottom line, kappa builds the body that you live in and then it keeps it in repair after that. Pitta fuels it and provides the chemical reactions that make your cells work. And vata is the master computer that moves everything and regulates everything else. We have these doshas in balance, we have balanced health. Ayurveda does name diseases. Some of the diseases we'll talk about today are disease names from Ayurveda, but only for convenience. So if we had uh, 10 people with psoriatic arthritis and we lined them up against the wall, their treatments would have some similarity because they all have the same disease, but it's much more individualized than conventional medicine. We're looking at uh, their gender, their age, the stage of disease, what their diet has been, all those factors when we decide what to recommend to move ahead. There is no universal best diet or best medicine or best lifestyle for everybody. It's based on individual assessment. It works very, very well. So health is a balance of the doshas, that's it. That's all we're looking for, and it, it may take a lifetime to achieve it, but slowly but surely we're working our way back toward that zone of dynamic balance to create these, uh, the balanced uh, doshas. The type of person who tends to develop autoimmune disorders is a person who is born with the tendency to have a lot of um, extra heat in their body or to veer off in the direction of inflammation very easily. And we have to constantly be aware of that and adjust that. Um, you don't have to be that type of person to develop the diseases, but usually that's the situation. So a person with a pitta body style, Ayurveda would describe as being like a frog, medium-sized, muscular, athletic, dynamic, productive, intense. And those are the people who tend to get these, uh, uh, these disorders. So the classic pitta person, here's a picture of Steve Irwin. Of course, now we now, now know deceased. Uh, he was probably the most pitta person ever created on planet Earth, but uh, productive, determined, intelligent people in general um, grasp uh, concepts and digest them just like our body pitta digests food in the digestive tract. And those are the people that tend to develop um, eczema and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and you know inflammatory diseases. The basic nature of these people is that their body is easily inflamed. Now again, anybody can develop these, but these people who were born with this tendency, much more likely. The outstanding characteristic of these people, both personality-wise and in their life and their job, is productivity. This is that foreman on your crew who wants every job uh, uh, under time and uh, you know on budget. The small, the small intestine is where Pitta primarily acts, and we know from modern science that the gut is the place where most inflammation starts in the inflammatory cascade that causes uh, these 80 different autoimmune uh, disorders uh, often starts in the mucous membrane and particularly the gut. So the whole idea of leaky, a leaky gut was described uh, in Ayurvedic text 2,000 years ago as a very well-known kind of idea, and that's the genesis of these disorders in today's understanding. These doshas tend to dominate at particular times of the life cycle. So the middle of life from about 20 to 60 uh, is when this pitta dosha or the inflammatory tendency 
uh, is the highest. And so, as you know, if you know anybody that's developed these disorders, uh, you know, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, how many seven-year-olds do you know with, with uh, rheumatoid arthritis? None. How many do you know 87-year-olds with rheumatoid arthritis? Well, they may have had it earlier, but it tends to have calmed down. They may be disfigured from it, but they typically don't have nearly as much active inflammation because their body has cooled down. Right around 40, 42 is the, is the peak of these things, and that's most people present with things like rheumatoid arthritis at about age 30, 32, 33, something like that, whether it's adult acne or, you know, rosacea or uh, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. That's when it tends to strike when the body is going up that hill of pitta. So this time of life, people, generally speaking, everybody tends to be a little hotter and they have this inflammatory tendency. Now, for some people, that never goes to the, the um, extent of becoming a disease. But again, if you sort of have this uh, type of body that you've inherited, it can. This is a time in your life when you're productive and sexual and active and hot and intense and personality-wise, you get things done and like that, but the, dis the problem is inflammatory disorders. Everybody warms up on that same schedule, and if you're a little warmer than everybody else, you tend to develop these issues. So we're looking at the symptoms of pitta in this case, and if we're looking at whether or not a person has high pitta in their body currently. So a moderate body weight is real typical. You notice most of the people you know who develop rheumatoid arthritis are medium-sized muscular people. Um, the diseases that Pitta brings, of course, are inflammation we've talked about, but hot diseases and then loose elimination and short and sound uh, sleep. So the symptoms we're looking at, inflammation, if there's pain, it tends to be burning, and then all these other things that tend to go along with it. Pastel colors like red, green, and yellow uh, tend to occur in the tissues with these kinds of things. And this is kind of the stereotypical person who develops these uh, issues. And so if this is you, you might want to start uh, looking ahead to how you can prevent these issues. The remedies are going to be the opposite energetics, very straightforward. So for Pitta, the qualities of these, all these disorders, these autoimmune disorders, are hot and wet. And so our approach is going to be to cool things down and dry things out. And ultimately, that's where we want to go with all of our discussion of remedies as we proceed. Ayurveda has a concept called Ahankara, which uh, is the literally means the I form. A hung is me, and cut is to do something. You probably heard karma. That means you know things that you do. Um, so it, the idea is that it's the thing that makes you you. Your consciousness of being an individual entity separate from the rest of the world. It defines your personal self. And when it's functioning properly, you have good psychological and physical uh, boundaries, and you're. In, in some ways, it's the immune system. You don't let things in, but also your body knows what's you and what's not you, and it can control your body's regulation of that. So your body doesn't attack itself. It knows what is you. It's the intelligence of our vital energy in the body, uh, we could say. So something is wrong with this when people develop an autoimmune disease. Fundamentally, your body should not be attacking itself. So there's something really wrong at the core of the way your body and mind are uh, functioning. So what are the, Ayurveda is a system of physical, mental, and spiritual development, and it considers every aspect of the person from gross to subtle. So Ayurveda would say that in autoimmune disorders, you have poor self-boundaries. Your body doesn't understand what it's supposed to attack. It starts by being exposed to something that your immune system doesn't recognize. Uh, you know, you eat a strawberry and you have hives and itchy eyes and runny nose. Your body activated your immune system for a protein in that strawberry that shouldn't have been an enemy. Your body just should have said, oh, that's a strawberry. I know what that is. No need to get excited. But your body did that. And then a little further, and this is true of all autoimmune disorders, your body says, you know, the protein from that strawberry looks an awful lot like the protein from my thyroid. Maybe that's an enemy too. Maybe I should attack that. And it starts to create antibodies not just to strawberry proteins but to thyroid proteins. So the body attacking itself is a... Uh, a crime of nature, it results from some issue from the past. There's a genetic component uh, for sure, poor self boundaries. Ayurveda has a concept called ojas, which roughly is the charge in your battery. You know, your body is the battery and it can uh, contain a certain amount of reserve energy, and ojas is that reserve energy. It comes from the food that you eat and everything else you put in your mouth and your breath and everything you do, all the inputs into your body get concentrated into this very specific, very concentrated essential energy uh, in the body. And that's 
that's uh, stored. So if we look at these tissue types, Ayurveda talks about various types of tissue. And the idea is that you eat food, and then there's a sequential transformation of the nutrients in that food, getting more and more and more subtle. And eventually it turns into uh, ojas. And so Ayurveda says uh, you have very, very tiny amount of this. My teacher defined this as 100 bites of food becomes one drop of blood. 100 drops of blood become one drop of ojas. And um, that's a pretty good way to describe it. Uh, you know, that's a very, very, that's a 10,000 times reduction uh, to, you know, 10,000 bites of food to make one drop of ojas. So this is very precious uh, material. Ayurveda would say that uh, you have a deficiency of ojas. You've been eating the wrong things. You haven't been able to digest them. And now you don't have reserve energy to run your body, and your body makes these mistakes of attacking things it shouldn't attack. So we end up with pitta out of balance. If you've eaten a diet or you have a, a type of body that tends to be high in this inflammatory tendency pitta, then pitta starts to rise. And it accumulates due to your bad lifestyle choices. Uh, things that aggravate pitta are hot emotions like anger, um, hot foods like uh, chilies and garlic, things that might be very healthy for other people. If you have this tendency of pitta going, getting higher and higher, inflammation, uh, eating spicy food, uh, bad choices in your life, uh, being all revved up about your job, uh, you know, leads to things, high blood pressure and just being all pumped up, bad lifestyle choices. Uh, your digestion weakens because of not uh, because of being nutrient deficient and not eating proper food. Pitta gets aggravated and then overflows into the tissues. This idea comes straight from Ayurveda. They ha it has no uh, corollary in modern medicine. The idea that an energy gets uh, exaggerated from your lifestyle and flows into your tissues completely foreign to conventional medicine. But it, the model works very very well if you stick with it. Then you end up with an actual pathology caused by pitta, which can be, you know, lupus or uh, psoriatic arthritis, any of these things. So pitta, and you could ask, okay, great. So we have too much heat in the body. The body's not able to control the amount of inflammation. So what? Well, it ends up being attracted to some weak site. And that weak site in the body would be, could be from previous uh, damage, from trauma. Somewhere it's an area that has become weakened from the way you lived your life. And that could be inherited. We know that many of these diseases have an inherited uh, uh, component to them, but it's not all inherited because some people get uh, lupus without a family history and some people with a family history don't get lupus. So it's individual. I'm here to tell you that these diseases can be absolutely uh, handled, controlled, treated very, very effectively. We've been doing it for thousands of years. We do it every day today. And we have a lot of great modern tools like the kinds of things that this website uh, offers you to be able to uh, uh, used to solve this issue. These inflammatory autoimmune disorders also involve some kind of toxin, some kind of substance that shouldn't be in your body that got stuck there. And that idea of toxicity is very common in natural medicine. And I'm sure if you went to the website that's presenting this and sniffed around, you'd find a lot of information about toxicity. So you have accumulation of inflammatory tendency that went to you know, your knee, your skin, your kidney, your face, your thyroid, whatever it was, and then waste material that got stuck in there. And those two interact to create this uh, soupy mess of hot goop that is what all these autoimmune diseases uh, are uh, all about. So we're recommending that people uh, use uh, digestive remedies in their uh, diet. Now, in a hot condition, we can't use very hot warming digestive things. So garlic is a warming digestive enhancing remedy, but it's probably too hot for people that have these hot diseases, so mildly warming digestives like coriander and fennel that we see here. One example of something that, that works very well is an Ayurvedic combination called trichotu. It means the three pungents. It's a combination of black pepper and ginger that you've probably heard about. Those are kind of medium spicy, and it's well tolerated by many people. It's a foremost digestive aid in Ayurveda. I use it every day with people. And the third element is uh, long pepper, which is a relative of black pepper. So these three uh, herbs have energies that are compatible and um, synergistic, and you use it as a combination to enhance the warmth of the digestive tract and promote better digestion all the way around. So it's a supremely detoxifying formula. Uh, it's a little on the drying side, and it's not so warming that it tends to cause drastic uh, problems. So black pepper, 
uh, ginger, and then here's the long pepper. It's a close cousin. You can see it looks like peppercorns that are stretched out to be an inch long. Rosayana means rejuvenating, so it's a detoxifier plus a rejuvenator, and this one is a little moisturizing. So these herbs complement each other to create this fantastic uh, blend here. So it, uh, using triphala, the typical way to do that would be to start with one gram per meal, which could be a powder or it could be capsules, and increase by one gram per meal until your tummy is uncomfortably warm. That might be three grams per meal, something like that, but that will facilitate more uh, complete digestion of your food and reduce the whole leaky gut cascade that causes these autoimmune uh, disorders. You don't want to take so much that you, you, know, you have an uncomfortably hot tummy, but you just push it to that point, back off a little. Very famous Ayurvedic formula, Triphala. There are ginger extracts available uh, now sometimes with tumorones that can promote uh, digestion. You could look for those and investigate that possibility that will do something very similar. Let's talk about immune regulating uh, remedies for these autoimmune disorders. Short term, we have some treatments that we want to use to suppress the inflammatory response. Those are all going to be cooling things because, like we see here with this person's hand, um, too uh, hot to inflame. So we'll get to those in a second. But there are three primary Ayurvedic herbs that are used to support, regulate, nourish the uh, immune system. First is ashwagandha, an herb I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's definitely found its way into the Ayurvedic uh, scene in the health food store. Very famous herb. It does so many things. But in this particular case, we're talking about long-term, slow-acting stamina, hormone balance and support for the immune system. So this is one of the main things we would use for all these disorders over time. It doesn't solve the problem today. You take a pill of, ash of ashwagandha today, you don't feel any different. But over many weeks, months, or years, uh, it's a core treatment for these kinds of disorders. Scientific name, withenia. This is the above ground portion of the plant. It looks, it's uh, related to tomatoes. We use the root. So it's uh, very well known for stamina. It's a fantastic, probably the best anxiety remedy in the world, from my point of view. And it helps regulate your sleep rhythms, which, of course, is critically uh, important. But one of the main historical uses in Ayurveda is exactly what we're talking about. Inflammatory disease like asthma and rheumatoid arthritis. And then you see all the other things that it does, which are, those for an, are for another webinar. Ashwagandha is a relatively mild herb. It's a very food-like herb. It's the root of a tomato-like plant, so the taste is very neutral. You can use the powder. And this is a, a remedy that's intended to be taken every day for the rest of your life, just a gram or two. Every day forever would be fine. It's much like ginseng is used in Chinese uh, medicine. You can put it in a smoothie, uh, stir it into a bowl of oatmeal or applesauce. It tastes like sawdust, basically. It's just nothing. And sometimes we use very large doses. If a person is very depleted, uh, we can use a dose of something like up to 60 grams, which would be um, eight tablespoons uh, uh, per day for a while to saturate their body and bring the regulatory functions of the immune system back online, and then we taper down to that lower dose of just a gram or two uh, a day. So very high-quality ashwagandha extracts are available. Again, you could sort of sniff around this website and see information about that and figure out how you want to handle that issue. But you could use the raw powder or you could use extracts that work well. Uh, they're much more convenient. The doses are going to be smaller and you could take those in a pill form. So that's uh, a few how you want to deal with them. Chitavri is another uh, very well known, just absolutely foundational herb in Ayurveda. Uh, it's uh, the cooling equivalent to ashwagandha. And those two are often used together. I often use them in a 50-50 mixture, which is quite common in Ayurveda. Uh, here's a shatavri plant and the farmer who grew it. Uh, it's a relative of asparagus. It's a very close cousin to the asparagus we eat as a vegetable. The vegetable is the stem, but here we're going to use uh, the root. So a major tonic. Now, this one is a little cooling and a little moisturizing, whereas the ashwagandha was a little warming and a little drying. Uh, so they make a good combination. Uh, ashwagandha is not so warming that it causes a problem with the uh, inflammation. So we could uh, use the root instead of the stem here, and we see what these roots look like. Those are going to be dried and powdered again. Chitavri is used for many other things uh, in the body, but here we're talking about its cooling nature for inflammation, its long-term stabilizing effect on the immune system, and again, this would be used uh, 
a gram or two a day uh, forever. We use it in higher doses sometimes for certain things like we see here uh, on the slide, but fundamentally it could be taken. So if you're, you have a body that's a little on the hotter side, which is what people with inflammatory autoimmune disorders tend to have, then shatavari probably would be a good choice. And you could take higher doses initially to, again, bring the immune system online and then taper down to uh, lower uh, doses. And it's very food-like, again. It's, you know, asparagus root, so capsules, soup, smoothies, however you want to use this. Uh, you could just stir it into, again, applesauce or anything like that. Um, in um, classes in, school, in Ayurveda school, we often uh, rehydrate these roots and chop them up and make soup out of them because it has a very nice asparagus kind of taste when it's rehydrated. So here you can see, again, these are uh, dehydrated roots. So acute symptoms um, for heat conditions like an inflammatory flare. So let's say a person is generally doing well with their lupus, but they're having, you know, it's kind of bumped up a little bit and they're having a little bit of a tough time and their skin is getting a little hot and they can tell they're heading toward a flare. Something like 15 grams would be good to control that, but just a gram or two every day over time. And you can mix and match those two. For that matter, you can mix and match anything we're discussing today because I've limited this to things that are safe for you to, uh, you know, to just give a, a try and use it. So Shatavari is being harvested by the farmer here, two grams long term. Kaduchi is the third herb that I wanted to talk about for long-term immune uh, regulation. This is an herb that's less well-known, but one of my favorite herbs. This is just a powerhouse. This herb works on your physical, mental, spiritual aspects, so many things. Uh, here we're talking about it for the immune system, and it's a major regulator. So we're going to talk about the vine in this case, the stems. Here's the scientific name and a little bit more uh, detail here. So this is used for everything from acute flu uh, to um, dementia and numerous other things in between. But we're talking here about anti-inflammatory immune issues, so long-term immune support. Uh, it's a tropical vine. It's a creeper. It creeps up trees in the wild, and on farms it's grown on a trellis like hops or raspberries. Um, so we're going to use that stem, like you see there. That'll be harvested and dried and chopped up and then uh, ground to powder, and you could use that. It's a rejuvenative anti-aging remedy. Again, a couple grams long-term uh, would be good. So we've talked about three herbs that you can use for long-term stability of your immune system. And your immune system is very closely re regulated by your endocrine system, and they're, they're the same system, really. So uh, you could uh, you get benefit from these in terms of hormone balance uh, as well. So Gaduchi is deeply tissue detoxifying and, of course, immune building. So the powder of Gaduchi, uh, 2 to 10 grams a day would be good, something like that. We could use a higher dose for more acute situations, but a couple grams. If you took a, a couple grams a day of ashwagandha, Chitavari and Gaduchi each over the next 10 years, you'd be amazed at the changes uh, in your body. They all work kind of slowly for immune issues. All right, let's move on to some things that specifically resolve Pitta in, more in the short term. They're cooling remedies that treat these hotter conditions. First is Boswellia gum. Boswellia is a uh, torchwood tree that's closely related to frankincense and myrrh, which we all have heard about. Boswellia grows in uh, India, and it, this is the sap, the dried sap or the gum from the tree. These are the trees. Indian frankincense, it's sometimes called. John Boswell was a Scottish botanist that trooped around Asia naming everything after himself, so there's a whole bunch of Boswell stuff, all, you know, in the scientific names. But it's the gum that exudes from these little uh, plants that grow in arid uh, regions of India. So that gum then is powdered, and you can take that, and extracts are available. You could take it in capsule form, you could take it in powder form, or you could use an extract that where the active ingredients have been concentrated. The, um, it's called salai in uh, the common name in uh, India. So you can look around for Boswellia extracts that uh, concentrate the active ingredients and separate them out from the inactive ingredients here. That way the doses would be a little smaller. But all these anti-pitta remedies that work quickly to reduce inflammation uh, you take the dose that works for you. So you, if the, it was a pill, let's say that you were taking, you take one pill today, two pills tomorrow, three, three pills the next day, and you titrate your dose up to the place where you're noticing you're getting a reduction in your inflammatory symptoms, and then you stabilize it at the dose that gives you the best day-to-day -day, uh, reduction. So these are not intended to be taken long-term. They're short-term 
uh, remedies to deal with symptoms or crisis. Uh, the next one is Amla, and this is the number one remedy in all of Ayurveda for Pitta. Now, this one does tend to work a little more slowly, but its effect is only on Pitta, really. It's not the uh, more general immune uh, booster like those other ones, first three we talked about. This is a fruit. They look like they'd be tasty, uh, but they are not. The word Amla actually means sour. They're very sour, very bitter, quite intense. You wouldn't eat them like an apricot. But uh, one of the most revered remedies in all of Ayurveda, it's a long-term anti-inflammatory, uh, supremely antioxidant. It often wins these uh, experiments that measure 100 or 200 or 500 substances for their antioxidant potential, and often amla is in the top or, you know, the top three or five. So very effective anti-inflammatory. In India, it's made into all kinds of culinary items like uh, relish and pickles and, and um uh, candy and syrup and all kinds of stuff, but we're probably going to find it in pills here, and that's perfectly fine. So you take the amount needed over a matter of the next, let's say, few days or weeks to get the maximum anti-inflammatory uh, effect. Uh, I just thought I'd show you the amla juice. Uh, you're not going to want to drink this. It's available in India. We can't get fresh amla here. It, it's not allowed to be imported, but in Canada, you can get it. Canada is a commonwealth country, so it's easy to import from India, which is also a Commonwealth country, but here we uh, we can't get it fresh, but you can get it dried. You can get the juice bottled, actually, here if you want to try it. I think you'll try it once, and that'll be the last time, but I've ordered it at health food restaurants in India, and, uh, you know, it's about what you'd expect, but, you know, like we eat less than perfect tasting health food here for our sake of our health, they do that there as well. So powdered amla, something like uh, capsules or uh, powder, about 10 grams a day, would be good for controlling short-term uh, inflammation. Uh, neem, a much more powerful herb. Uh, this is the coldest herb by far that we've talked about, and this is used for um, short-term treatment of hot conditions in Ayurveda to reduce pitta, reduce that uh, that heat and inflammation. Bitter, very cold, and uh, again, it's not very culinary. It is used in food. I mean, Grandma will put a pinch of it in stew to give you that little bitter element that adds to the taste. Uh, but uh, you, even tea is pretty intense to try to try to use. This is a neem tree. They're very large trees, and they're called the village pharmacy because people often plant them like this in the middle of the village for everybody to come out and, and pick from. And many parts are used, but in this case, we're talking about the leaf. So it's a bitter digestive. It treats fever, all those things, does numerous of those things. But here we're talking about its cold, bitter nature to reduce inflammation, and it works quite quickly. So you're going to, you want to use the powdered leaf that's easily available and, you know, powder or capsules, about five grams. And again, you just adjust that dose depending on the response that you're getting from your body. So most people get a pretty noticeable cooling effect in their inflammation from uh, about five grams uh, a day. Uh, powder is going to be pretty tough to take. If you stirred that into a bowl of applesauce, you'd be hard-pressed to eat the applesauce. So maybe um, capsules. Uh, would be the way to go. Grandmas will give it to kids in India as tea, but you know how that goes. Well, turmeric uh, certainly is a very, very famous herb. Uh, it's Turmeric is the most studied substance on planet Earth in terms of uh, today's science. Thousands of papers have been written on uh, turmeric, but mainly on its main anti-inflammatory constituent, uh, curcumin. So turmeric could be used fresh in your food. You can juice it. You can cook it into food. Just like you'd use fresh ginger, you can use fresh turmeric. That's very available now in uh, grocery stores, and you could try that. Or you could use the dried uh, turmeric and take that in your food or in capsules. The thing about turmeric is that it's fantastic for inflammation. Uh, I'm, I've been a missionary for turmeric for 45 years. When I learned it from my teacher, when I was very young, starting my career, and I was so impressed with it that I went around and tried to convince everybody about it. And they said, you mean that stuff that, that colors hot dog mustard? That's, that doesn't do anything. And here we are 47 years later with the most, you know, studied substance on planet Earth. So I feel uh, redeemed. So the turmeric missionary, anyway, I, the problem with turmeric is that in order for it to treat acute inflammation, you're talking about a pretty high dose. So if you're having an inflammatory flare, you might end up using something like a four tablespoons of turmeric to get a noticeable effect, let's say overnight. And it works great, but most people are disinclined to take four tablespoons of turmeric. Um, I would just stir it into a glass of water, plug the nose and drink it down. But you know, if you find that to be problematic, you can use concentrates. And those are going to concentrate this main active constituent curcumin 
which is what all the research has been done on. Turmeric is about 7% curcumin. So it, um, it can be extracted from the root, concentrated, and now you get something that's 17 times the inflammatory uh, potential of the raw turmeric. So curcumin substance supplements are available, and those work very, very well for uh, short-term inflammation. Uh, there are numerous other constituents in uh, turmeric that are also beneficial and now starting to get some attention. We talked about the tumorones earlier that are uh, oil-soluble constituents that are also in the turmeric, and those are used, as I mentioned, with ginger supplements, uh, in, uh, used in supplements with ginger earlier. So numerous curcumin supplements, and uh, if you use a high-quality curcumin supplement, uh, you can uh, get dramatic uh, relief from inflammation very quickly. You need to take enough. That's kind of the problem. Curcumin is not absorbed very well. It needs to be kind of fiddled with in the um, presentation of the supplement, the, the uh, formulation of the supplement to enhance its absorption, and that's available now. But you use the amount that gives you noticeable, immediate, you know, substantial relief. So if you're having trouble with, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or something like that, um, you could take something like one the first day, two the next day, three the next day, until you began to get the results that you wanted and then sustain that amount as long as you were having a flare. Ayurveda is focused on uh, the small intestine for pitta, as we said. So uh, one strategy in Ayurveda for treating these pitta disorders is to dump the accumulated waste material, that leaky gut stuff, out of the small intestine for which we use laxatives. Uh, this idea, again, doesn't have a corollary in modern medicine, but it works very well. Uh, I'm just going to mention one of these laxatives that we use, and this is this plant, Nishrot. It's the root of a morning glory family uh, plant, and it, it works high in the gut, so it helps you to dump that waste material from your small intestine. You're not going to do this every day, but you would use it from time to time to make sure that your body is not accumulating this undesirable waste material that then gets absorbed through your leaky small intestine. And uh, it's a, a very core uh, idea in Ayurveda. So here's the scientific name, a little bit more details here. Uh, the, the copy of these slides is available to you if you don't yet have it. So I'll let uh, Cheryl and Lexi talk to you about that at the end, about uh, where and how to get that. But it, you don't need to be scribbling everything down here. I was probably should have showed you that in the, in the beginning. Anyway, here are the energetics of what it's all about. And it dumps that waste material from the small uh, intestine. This one is a little less available, but with some snipping around, uh, you could find it. And certainly, you're welcome to email me anytime, anyway, about any of these questions. I'm not going anywhere. I'd be glad to, uh, you know, get back to you on these kinds of things. So it is a purgative ingredient in some Ayurvedic formulas that are designed to treat these sorts of disorders. Ayurveda has been treating autoimmune disorders as long as there's been Ayurveda in human beings, and so we've done it for a long time. Some dietary concerns, uh, because these are inflammatory or pitta conditions, we want to use anti-pitta remedies, which are going to be cooling. So sweet, bitter, and astringent tastes we're going to focus on. Those are the cooling tastes. Bitter reduces heat in general in the body, including uh, the liver. Uh, ghee is thought to be profoundly anti-inflammatory in Ayurveda, and it's literally the most important Ayurvedic medicine for treating pitta. So your body can make anti-inflammatory hormones like uh, cortisol, out of the, uh, the healthy fat with, with the ghee. Uh, sweet juices tend to be cooling, things like pear juice, sweet astringent pear and apple juice. These would be things we would emphasize for people that have these diseases of excess heat where the body is not managing that extra heat properly. Uh, we do not want people to be eating these pungent foods, so chilies, onions, garlic, and all that spicy stuff. They love it. They ju I just guarantee that people with these disorders uh, are over-consuming this spicy stuff. Uh, it's just, you know, if you have that kind of a body, you learn to love these things. Uh, but it's off the, off the table, sorry to say. We want you to eat, uh, you know, salads and uh, cucumbers. So some more other cooling foods. Um, anti-inflammatory foods would be things like cucumbers. Uh, if they're raw, they're that much more anti-inflammatory. And this is an idea that goes way, way back and has been used by uh, all the natural healing systems, naturopathy, you know, they all focus on this kind of idea of anti-inflammatory foods. And, of course, the anti-inflammatory diet, very popular now. So green vegetables, uh, the most anti-inflammatory uh, category of uh, food that we would eat. So raw green juices in general would be fine. You're not going to live on raw green juices, but just add those to your repertoire 
so that your diet is slightly on the cooling side because your body is slightly on the heating side. Makes a big difference. Celery, another cooling remedy that you could eat. Uh, raw steamed or juice, it's all cooling, but you know, raw is even better. Also happens to be a nerve nutrient, so you get that benefit uh, from it. So celery juice would be anti-inflammatory. It's hard to eat a lot of celery, just tedious. And so if you juice it, you can get a lot of celery in very easily, and that would be the way to go. So that would be a real core idea. These sweet juices, these anti-inflammatory juices, the bitter juices, in Ayurveda for hot uh, autoimmune diseases. Bitter melon is one of the uh, coldest foods that we would even consider food. Now, if you go out and try some tonight, uh, you might uh, think that it was ridiculous that I even suggested that this could be a food. I really like it for healing, and I talk about it a lot, and so the students always go out and try it, and, uh, and then come back and say, you know, come on, that's not, that, that's not edible. So you might, uh, if you try it, if you know how to cook a zucchini, you now know how to cook a bitter melon. So it can be uh, steamed, sauteed, baked, juiced, anything like that that you want, and it's all going to be bitter, and it's going to be the bitterest food you've ever tasted. But it is edible. By the way, every Chinese restaurant has bitter melon on the menu. Um, it may not, be, or they have it in the restaurant. It may not be on the menu because it's so bitter that most people won't order it. But if you want to be a uh, sophisticated gourmet diner, you could ask your waiter, do you happen to have bitter melon? They always do, and you, for their Asian clientele, and you could say, uh, I'd like mine in brown sauce, please, and you'll have a real treat. Bitter melon, a very, very cooling. Another idea for a cooling uh, beverage, uh, these are all cooling ingredients, and so this could be a cooling evening drink for pit, pitta people with these high inflammatory kinds of things. Lassi is a dilute yogurt drink that's inherently cooling, and then here we have powdered rose petals that are also cooling. So we want to look at every aspect of the person's life. And of course, we're just touching the surface here, but we want to talk about uh, how they eat, when they eat, what they eat, how they sleep, how they exercise, everything to cool them down and treat this underlying inflammation. Let's mention a couple things for a couple specific disorders here. Uh, this is a classic case of advanced rheumatoid arthritis. You can see that one middle finger there on the left. That's called the sausage digit. And you can see it's swollen up to twice the size of the other things. It's drastically inflamed like a sausage. And that's a classic presentation for rheumatoid arthritis. But you can see that this, is, this person has had this a long time. These are aged hands, obviously, but they've already experienced the, the deformation. So rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, these are all kinds of things to uh, look at. Well, here's a, a remedy for uh, inflammation. Um, using a gaduchi that we talked about, ginger powder, and some ghee. So you will get the PDF of this. You can take a look at it. But we, this is a way to get in gaduchi enough ginger to be able to metabolize that gaduchi. Again, we don't want to get, go uh, wild with the ginger because it's a little warming, but in modest doses for inflammation, it's, uh, you know, it's good. Here's a, a remedy. Uh, using an eggplant, and this is a rheumatoid arthritis kind of uh, remedy, and it's cooking the eggplant with castor oil, if you can believe it. Now, if you've tasted castor oil, you can imagine what this is going to be like. It's not too bad. Some people will tolerate it more than others, but this is absolutely classic, right straight out of, you know, traditional Ayurveda. So you're going to um, steam bake uh, eggplant in castor oil in a pan on the stove with a little bit of mildly warming digestive spice that you always see in Ayurveda and then try that out. Uh, you, you, no emails, please, when you try it and say, how, how could you believe that that was actually a food? But castor oil is, is pretty slimy and has kind of a weird taste. But you know, in the eggplant, not too bad. Anyway, that's uh, just core Ayurvedic kind of idea. Psoriatic arthritis, um, the, another idea here is to use these herbs that we've talked about to treat the pathological uh, doshas in the body, the joints, the skin. And, classic combination would be neem, amla, and gaduchi that we talked about. So neem is a fast-acting herb that's quite cooling and works drastically quickly to treat discomfort. Amla is a kind of a medium-term herb that works, again, to treat uh, the heat, uh, but takes a few days to really kind of kick in. And then gaduchi is really a much more long-term kind of remedy. So that combination is classic for psoriatic arthritis. And we could get into many more of these combinations for those kinds of uh, 
issues. Almost here to Q&A. I'm just reminding you about the handouts. There's a dozen or so handouts that go into much more detail with these things if you're interested. Here's the link. The link will be on the uh, document that we'll make available to you for the uh, for these, and you can uh, uh, check that out. Uh, this is my uh, school. The website for the school there, International Integrative, pretty easy to remember. And then just my name is my website, keithycalsa.com. That's my personal uh, website. All right. There we are. I, if we have questions, now is the time. Thank you so much. What an informative discussion. Uh, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to share this information with us. Oh, well, looks like we got a little bit of feedback. I hope I'm not uh, having too many auditory problems with the folks listening today. Let's get started with some of the questions. The first is, um, do you have any suggestions for healing granuloma annulare? Well, way too specific to uh, go into here. Uh, the Some of the things that we talked about would be appropriate there, but that's not a condition that's very amenable to self-treatment, so I think I'm going to defer that one. Okay. Here's another one about, is there uh, any way that you can use Ayurveda to help manage the autoimmune disease of type 1 diabetes? Oh uh, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, these The kinds of things we talked about here today manage the autoimmune aspect uh, of that. Uh, by the way, it's, the, the consensus is not necessarily that di type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder. That's one theory. And that fits some of the facts, and there's some other theories that fit some other facts. So that's kind of what I was saying about uh, autoimmune diseases being the new darling. Is everybody wants to attribute everything that's going on to autoimmunity, uh, and it may or may not be. But assuming that it is, uh, that gets into a much uh, more uh, detailed discussion. I, you know, I don't know if we're going to be able to go into specific diseases and give specific kinds of remedies, but. I will mention that that bitter melon we talked about is excellent for uh, suppressing blood sugar, and uh, it's pretty much 100% guaranteed. If you eat enough uh, bitter melon, it doesn't cure the disease. As far as we know, type 1 diabetes is incurable, but that remedy will suppress blood sugar. It pretty much works for everybody every time. The question is you have to eat the bitter melon. So some people prefer to, you know, bake it up and eat it as a food every day. For most people, it takes about two melons uh, during the day to control their blood sugar, and it works kind of slowly, so it's more like sustained release insulin. It's an insulin mimic, we could say. Some people prefer to juice it. Dose is usually about four ounces of juice, and then you can just plug your nose and slug it down. So that works virtually every time. Now, of course, you want a person to do that very carefully. You're not going to stop injecting insulin and switch right over to, to bitter melon. That should be a discussion with your doctor and work your way through it. So we talked about bitter melon as an anti-inflammatory for the uh, autoimmune pitta part, but we're using it here for a different use, and that's a short-term, just day-by-day -day suppression of the immune system. I will tell you that we have a very close co colleague, Alan Tillotson, who is uh, 65. Uh, he's had type 1 diabetes for over 50 years. He was um, on his deathbed literally trekking in Nepal when he was a teenager, and he was uh, taken uh, unconscious to an Ayurvedic doctor in Kathmandu, who then became his mentor, and he was a student of that teacher his entire adult life, and I know Alan very well. Uh, he doesn't have one symptom of diabetes ever. He's very disciplined, but he's also used Ayurveda. Um, his kidneys are in great shape. He doesn't have any you know, skin or vision kinds of problems. Uh, he's never had blood sugar uh, issues. He injects insulin because, of course, his pancreas was roasted. And he's been able to control it his entire life with no, if you looked at his blood tests without uh, knowing that he had type 1 diabetes, you would have no idea that he had any kind of degenerative disease. So I've been very close to that condition. I've known him for, you know, 30 plus years and we, uh, I've just seen it play out in action. So we know that it can work very, very well. Excellent. Um, for the lady who w had the question about granuloma annulare, if I can uh, speak to that for just a second, I did want to mention that there's often a problem with the thyroid gland as well. Often the two go hand in hand with this autoimmune skin condition. So if you have not had your thyroid health checked out lately, that might be something to look into as well. 
Um, another question that came up uh, has to do with ghee. They have trouble acquiring good ghee. They try to go to reputable stores, but they said they, it, it's always rancid. Do you have any commentary on that? Yeah, that's horrible to hear. And it had to be uh, rancid when it was being made because ghee is self-preserving and doesn't go rancid. In fact, it's you don't have to refrigerate it. And um, it's in uh, India, there are barrels of 100-year-old ghee because Ayurveda considers ghee to improve as it ages. So people 100 years ago uh, buried sealed barrels of ghee for us to dig up today, and we're repaying the favor by refilling the barrels and, and uh, preparing them for people 100 years from now. Uh, I would suggest, well, the thing to do would be to, um, to look for uh, quality uh, suppliers. Now, in one of the handouts that I provided for you there on my website is uh, quality Ayurveda uh, suppliers. And so these various kinds of things that are oddball that you're not going to be able to find by sort of sniffing around the website that's offering this webinar, you could, um, you know, you could find there. And that would include ghee um, uh, providers. Uh, but it's very, very easy to make yourself. You can just get good quality butter and there's a million uh, YouTube videos about how to do it. And you could look at those, and if you have any problem, just uh, you know, give me a call and I can send you some instructions. But that's probably the way to go. It's just make your own. I didn't realize yeah. it was so easy to make on your own. Very easy. It's just clarified butter, really, and you can just get any butter and good quality butter, and you just do it on your stovetop. It takes half an hour. No big deal. Excellent. Excellent. Good to know. Um, we, another question wants to know if, uh, with autoimmune diseases, are there any food contraindications that are specific food contraindications? For example, is it milk or uh, gluten or any of those types of things? Well, I guess I have to say not to, to use uh, milk and gluten because everybody expects that. Uh, that's a, an <laughs> issue that we're still sort of, um, you know, hashing out in our culture about. Uh, you know, uh, how that's all working and why people have those sensitivities. Um, people, typically when people go to India, they do not have those sensitivities. And I talk to people, uh, you know, literally every week who, you know, they eat a piece of bread in the United States and their nose runs. They, you know, they drink a milk and they get a tummy ache and they go to India and try a little bit just as an experiment, nothing happens. And they're gorging themselves on chapatis and yogurt for two weeks with no problems, and then they come back and figure, okay, I guess it's, it's over, and they eat a cracker and their nose runs again. So there's a lot of issues around this that have to be discussed. It's a, it's a complex issue. Those in and of themselves are not associated with autoimmune issues, but we do know a lot of people have sensitivity. Uh, not specific foods, but foods that are inflammation uh, provoking. Uh, sugar goes without saying, that provokes inflammation. And if in your body, things like milk and, and uh, gluten provoke uh, inflammation, then of course you shouldn't use it. But we want uh, foods that are, you know, inherently warming to be avoided. Uh, those lists are easily available on the internet. And if you want me, if you would like a list, just email me and I'd be glad to shoot one out to you. Excellent. All right, let's see. Um, I'm going to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Oops, we got some that came, might have come in the chat box, so we're going to double check that. All right. Here's another. Um, do you have any treatments? I know you don't want to go into specifics, but do you have any ideas for helping people with interstitial cystitis? Yeah. Interstitial cystitis is uh, inflammation of the bladder. That's literally what it means. And it's supposed to be non-infectious. The uh, cystitis just tells you this inflammation and doesn't indicate whether it's infectious or not. But the distinction between having your generic bladder infection or UTI and cystitis is that cystitis is supposed to be the non-infectious version. But I've treated this hundreds of times, and every single time it turned out to be uh, infectious in nature. So typically, women who develop this, men can have it, but it's drastically more common in women. Women who develop it have had a long history of uh, bladder infections, and it's not at all uncommon for women to have had 50 bladder infections uh, in a row. Um, so they, you know, they had an infection, they took an antibiotic. Things were good for two weeks, it came back. It's the same bug. They take the antibiotic again, it's good for two weeks. Eventually that antibiotic doesn't work, they switch to another one. They've been through 
you know, six different antibiotics and 50 infections. What eventually happens is that the tissue just gets extremely irritated, and very often the tissue is, uh, the, the infection is still there, and they've created a multi-resistant bug that now specializes in living in their bladder, and it's uh, dug very deep into the mucous membrane, and it just doesn't, when you do a urine test, you don't see it in the test, but it's still in the membrane. So you want to use um, anti-infection uh, remedies. I'll give you two suggestions. Now, the, for the one that I usually use, which has dr drastically good success, I teach about this all the time, so I've had hundreds of women come back to me and said, yep, that did the job. Uh, is golden seal, which is not an Ayurvedic herb whatsoever. It's a North American herb, but golden seal has everything that you want for this situation. It's cold, so therefore anti-inflammatory. It's astringent, so it helps to tighten up these membranes, and it's uh, antibacterial, uh, so it kills the bugs. And you're talking about a very high dose, like 20 grams a day for three weeks, maybe something like that. But for most people, that will just knock the cystitis, and that's the end of it. Just amazing. The other one is an Ayurvedic herb, and this herb is called Gokshara. It's a funny name, but G-O-K-S-H-U-R-A, Gokshara. That does not treat the infection, but that's Ayurveda's go-to remedy for bladder conditions in general and bladder inflammation. So that would be a part of an Ayurvedic protocol for uh, cystitis. Ayurveda has very specific, detailed protocols for those things, but all these Ayurvedic protocols are sort of multifactorial, you know. So that's another inflammatory condition, and we would put you on a cooling diet. We'd want remedies that have an affinity for the bladder. So we would want tissue building and cooling anti-inflammatory remedies. And if it's an infection, then we want to use antimicrobials. So Ayurveda does have other herbs similar to golden seal, but they're a little more obscure and would be harder to find. So that combination likely to work quite well. Excellent. 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 Let's see if I missed anything else. I have two different screens to check, so it takes me just a moment to make sure I didn't miss anything. Cheryl, with these various conditions that we're talking about, um, I've written 3,000 uh, magazine articles, and my articles appear often in, you know, your typical kind of health food store magazine. So uh, if you're interested in a recommendations for a specific condition, don't hesitate to email me. It's just a click of a mouse for me to pop you out an article. So I have written articles on cystitis and bladder infection both, and if people are interested, uh, I'd be glad to shoot something out. Excellent. Well, that's a really good resource to have. Thank you. It uh, looks like we had one last question that came in, wanting to know if you can recommend a good diet for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto's is right uh, in the same category as all these other ones, and uh, the diet is going to be the same, antipitta cooling kinds of remedies. I don't have anything real specific for suppressing thyroid antibodies, but it's the same process. Your body is attacking, you know, instead of attacking your synovial membrane like rheumatoid arthritis, it's attacking your thyroid gland, and so you want to use cooling anti-inflammatory uh, kinds of things. I have an excellent, uh, you know, long detailed article on Hashimoto's I'd be glad to send out, which goes into a lot more detail, but fundamentally that's the bottom line. Excellent. You know, I really like um, this presentation specifically because I don't get a lot of exposure to ashwagandha medical practice. And I really like the idea that we're looking at going back to the very basics, you know, what conditions in the body has set us up for certain types of dysfunction that manifest themselves in a broad spectrum of diseases. Instead of looking at, as the Western model does, now that the disease has already manifested itself and it's just causing all these problems, what we can, can we do to fight back against the disease instead of what can we do to fix what's underlying in the body that created these conditions in the first place? That's the key difference between Ayurveda and today's conventional medicine, even alternative medicine. Ayurveda is very, very good at prevention. The idea is you're supposed to be born healthy and then we help you stay healthy. Of course, today, 99% uh, of the people that come to see us are because they're busted and, you know, they want the quick fix up. So we have to do that to a certain extent. But ideally, we'd like to sort of back down from the branches to the root. Ayurveda is very focused on proper lifestyle choices, as we said, and then uh, fixing the gut, the digestive tract, and then using long-term stamina-enhancing tonics like ashwagandha. If most people just took, honestly, like trick or two with their meal, we talked about that, and then ashwagandha every day, uh, they would get well 
uh, you know, from an ate a good diet, they would get well from doing that. But it would take five years. That's the problem. So people want some relief, and we help them short term. And then we have to try to convince them that you know it's not just the non-drug drug that they want. It's the mm-hmm. the long-term changes, like you suggested. Right. Excellent. Well, it's so good to know, and I really have enjoyed today's presentation. I hope you'll come back again and talk to us again about um, Ayurvedic medicine. It's been most informative. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Folks, we have a couple of uh, upcoming webinars that you might be interested in. The first is going to be presented on June 29th about solutions for stubborn viruses, the shingles, herpes, cold sore, and wart viruses, different types of natural interventions that can make a difference in these problems. And on Tuesday, July 11th, Dr. Cool Reed Chaudhry, who's the author of Prime, uh, Prime Your Gut for Weight Loss, is going to do a live Q&A session on some of her cleansing and weight loss principles. For those of you who would like to sign up for a free weekly newsletter, we hope you'll visit us at terrytalksnutrition.com. We are very respectful of your email addresses and we do not share them or sell them to anyone. Uh, We provide a once weekly newsletter with the latest in natural medicine information and lifestyle hints. You can listen to past recordings of our seminars by visiting the Terry Talks Nutrition website. You can also visit us on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel called Terry Talks Nutrition, all one word, where we house all of our past educational webinars. So if you've enjoyed this webinar or if it was uh, so rich and full of so many pieces of information that you'd like to listen to it again, uh, then please visit us at YouTube dot com backslash Terry Talks Nutrition and you'll find us. Uh, We'd be honored if you recommend it to your friends as well. Give us about uh, one day before we get it posted, but after tomorrow it should be up and ready to go. You can follow Terry on Twitter at twitter.com backslash Terry Lemeron and we'd be honored if you find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Terry Talks Nutrition uh, and like our page. So thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy day to learn more about Ayurvedic Medicine, thank you again for visiting with us, Uh, KP Khalsa, we really appreciate your time. I hope you'll join us again, but until then, good health to you. Bye-bye.